Today we're going to be finishing up 1 Peter. Now, I say that, I have to be honest, there are some really difficult passages in 1 Peter that nobody really understands. And to be quite honest, I skipped over those because they weren't really a part of our overall objective. But if you'd ever like to talk about those, I'd be glad to because you might know the answers that I don't have. But what we're doing right now is we're looking at the, the message of the New Testament church. Now, it's slowly running down out of the chronology that we have. We have another letter by Peter, one from the writer of Hebrews, and of course, the book of Revelation. And that's a little tough. Um, Caleb, would you mind setting that air conditioner at 72? I turned up the heat. Is it beginning to get warm? Let me look for... Oh, that's what I was looking for is a real thermostat. But if you had set it at 72, just hit the little button down. That way everybody knows if it gets beyond that, it'll kick on. So we're looking at the end of this letter. Now the, the context of the letter is these are really difficult times. Rome is in turmoil. Quite honestly, the leader of the Roman Empire is Nero. And it doesn't matter what source you go to, <clears throat> Nero is nuts. I mean, he's absolutely out of this realm of normal. He, his, his morality is very base. His decision-making is erratic. He does this, and then he contradicts it, and he does that. And because of it, he needed someone to blame. It was around this time that Rome caught fire. And if you remember, even though Nero did not play a fiddle when Rome was burning, there is still a lot of controversy as to how did the fire get started. And that's pretty easy. There were a lot of poor people living in a lot of terrible houses. That happens often in poor countries with the poor people. But there's, there was no real effort on the part of the people, it seemed, to control the fire. And because of that, Nero needed somebody to blame. And the easiest group to blame was the group that was the most misunderstood and one of the fastest growing groups, and those were the Christians. So now the Christians are being tortured, they're being persecuted, they're going through a terrible time all throughout the region, and Peter writes this letter as a note of encouragement. Now part of what he says is, listen, other people have suffered more, toughen up. Hey, look at what the Lord Jesus endured. But he also gave not only those stern words, but he gave some really short words of encouragement. And we're going to be looking at those today. The one is one we've already looked at. It's been in our text for a couple of weeks, but it's a good introduction. The first word is this, be humble. <clears throat> When everything is going wrong in your life, the easiest thing to do is to say, it's not fair. Find somebody to react against or react to. And, and Peter says, listen, when you're going through a hard time, like what we were just singing in one of our songs, understand that God is perfectly aware of what's going on. And more than just simply being aware, he is involved in that situation. So here's what he says. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. If you need a great verse to write on a piece of paper and stick on the mirror that you see every morning before you go out to your workplace, before you deal with all of the complexities that are, that are a part of the regular living as a family, that's a great little passage. Humble yourselves. Your mighty God is in control. And not only that, you can give all of your worries and cares to him. Why? Because he cares about you. 
So, number one, just a few facts that we'll run through under each short word of encouragement. Number one, submission is an act of faith. We are trusting God to direct our lives and to work out his purpose in his time. That is difficult to do because all of us are under an authority structure, a God-ordained authority structure. Now, we're not like the slave. There's nobody over us that dictates every part of our lives. But when we go to work, guess what we're to do? Willingly, even cheerfully, submit to those who have authority above us, over us. When you go to even something as simple as a club meeting, we know that even there you volunteer to be a part of a club. You go in with the attitude of, I am going to follow the lead of those who have been put in charge. God has authority in this world, and he shares his authority through structure. That's why it's so important for husbands and wives to understand the authority structure that God has ordained, for children and parents to honor that authority structure that has been put in place, even in a church. The church only functions as it should when people recognize what God has placed there and there's a willingness, there's an act of faith that says, I will follow the leadership in my church. It's so important. Here are some of the benefits. If you do that, number two, one of the benefits of this kind of a relationship with God is the privilege of letting him take care of your burdens. You've all been to a restaurant with a family, with another couple perhaps. What are the nicest words to ever hear when you go to a nice restaurant? You know what those words are? I put them on the paper. I've got this. Don't you love it? I mean, makes you feel kind of embarrassed looking pitiful and poor. But if you're not looking pitiful and poor, I mean, aren't you always blessed when someone says, no, no, I've got this. Let me, let me get this. I mean, that, those are great words to hear. Well, listen, when you are going through a trial, when the burden is so heavy that you're about to go down, there are no better words than to hear your heavenly father say, listen, I've got this. When you submit to the God-ordained authorities, when you have this attitude, one of the benefits is you can give all your worries and all of your burdens and your cares to God. Why? Because he will, he does care for you. Another benefit, number three, God gives us the courage to face our cares honestly and not run away. It's amazing what kind of a difference it makes when you're with somebody. Now, we've watched so many people in our church over these years lose a mate. And in talking to those individuals, they often mention the same thing. And that is the, the sense of aloneness at night. Because isn't it funny? We all have this experience. If you're in your house and you're with the family and you hear a noise, how do you respond? It's just one of the many noises in a house. If you're by yourself and you hear that same noise, then what happens? I mean, we start thinking, what was that? I don't remember hearing that before. I mean, there's that experience that all of us feel. Some are dealing with it in a serious life change. But notice what it says right here. God gives us courage to face our cares honestly and not run away. Why? Because when we humble ourselves under God's authority, at the right time, he will lift us up in honor. But even more so, it says he will give us courage. He will carry us through. We will be assured that he cares for us. Here's how Isaiah said it. Great words. 
Isaiah said, for I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. That's a great word, that God cares. And because God cares, he will be involved in our lives. Number four, God gives us the wisdom to understand the situation. Here's what James would have added to that conversation if they had all been sitting around the table. He would have said something like this. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. When I do this display of faith, by submitting to the authorities that God has placed in my life, doing it because I understand that God rules in my life. When I do that, then I can have this assurance that he knows and he cares. Because of that, I can ask him for help, and he will give wisdom. Two more, number five, God gives us the strength to do what we must do. Here's what Paul would have said if they'd all been around the table. He would have added to the conversation, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. Another great word of encouragement. Well, if we were sitting around that same table and and talking and fellowshipping, we might have heard the psalmist, David, say something like this. God gives us the faith to trust him to do the rest. Because there are always times when we get to a certain part in a situation where we think, I have done all that I can do, and that's not enough. I've tried my very best, and I'm still in trouble. Well, I think David might have added these words. He might have said, listen, here's what you need to understand. Your God who rules over everything and everybody, this one that you submit to, this one will lift you up and honor you at the right time. And because he cares, he will help you with all of your problems. Here's what David would have said. Give God, God gives us the faith to trust him to do the rest. He might say this, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Give your burdens to the Lord. And he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. Peter's final words, one is, listen, be humble. Submit to what God is doing in your life. Number two, be watchful. We are living in dangerous days. We are living in days where there's an enemy and it's all around us jumping into our lives at all times. And here's what we'll look at. Number one, one reason we have cares is because we have an enemy. I see Caleb in the back. He'll remember this day. There was a little bitty zoo in our city in Brazil. And we used to go up there. I mean, the only thing, it smelled like a zoo. You get that 90 to 100 degree weather and urine that hadn't been cleaned up. I mean, it it was a real experience in every area but we were there one day and I can't tell you now it was one of the the lions or panthers that were were prevalent in the Amazon area I don't remember now the exact breed of big cat but the mother had just given uh, birth to a little baby lion are those cubs or kits cubs all right so this little bitty cub still wet from the birth process And the guy who was there had taken it away from the mother because too often they'll hurt the baby, roll over it and all that. So he was outside the cage, the pen area, wiping it off with the towel. 
and we got to go up and hold that cute little cub. I mean, our hands were sticky afterwards, but I mean, it was really neat. It was a cute little animal. The mother was not so cute. See, what we've done is we've made such a big story about, oh, the devil made me do it and all kinds of things, and he's got his little horns and the cartoons. And sometimes what we've done is we've, we've taken this enemy, this roaring lion who seeks to devour, and, and we've put it down and we've said, oh, remember, he was just a cute little cub. No. No, that cub was cute for only a few hours. By then, its nature was prevalent. By then, it was awake. And even as a young lion cub, it would have bitten us and scratched us. Listen, we are fighting against an enemy. His agenda is clear. Jesus said he comes to kill, to destroy, and to steal. Well, let's take a look. Peter said this in 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand, st uh, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. So what do we do when we understand that the bad things, the, the overwhelming circumstances that come into our lives could be a part of the enemy's strategy against us? How do we respond to that, knowing that there is an enemy and he is against us? Well, a couple of things. Number two, respect your enemy. He is dangerous. There are certain kinds of shows I don't watch. It's not because they would scare me too bad. It's not because, you know, there's, there's nudity in it. It's simply because the intention of the show is to glorify the enemy, to make the enemy look less dangerous than he is. When we see that big lion in a zoo behind the bars with a fence between us and he's being fed on a regular basis. He looks one way. If we were out in the bush and we were walking and we could see those big yellow eyes shining in the dark and we heard him growling as if to say, I haven't eaten in days, we would see the lion in a completely different way. I mean, we would be scared to death. We'd have to find some way to fortify ourselves against his attack. Number one, respect your enemy. He is dangerous. Number two, recognize your enemy. He is a great pretender. He will try to present himself as an angel of light. You don't have to worry about him. There's nothing wrong with those kinds of songs or those kinds of shows or, or there's nothing wrong with playing those kinds of games or, or asking the, the angel of darkness who portrays himself as an angel of light to participate. No, stay away from all that. You understand that he is a great pretender. Number four, resist your enemy. Why do you resist him? Because he can be defeated. Sitting around that table, Peter might have heard Paul step in and said, oh, Peter, that makes me think here in our Bible study. It reminds me of this, a, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist 
the enemy, and the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing. Peter said, yeah, that's what I mean. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and he and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. We get, and I put them on the, the literature display rack, and I invite you to take them home. The ones that speak of the Christians around the world. There are certain articles, uh, go to a particular website, christianpost.com, on a regular basis to see what's happening in the Christian world. And there are certain articles I don't even want to read because you can tell by the title, tell by the picture that this is another article of simple God-fearing people who are paying the ultimate price for standing by the Lord Jesus. And then I look at my own life and I think how often I have failed him Without the, the strong wind of a terrible tornado, it's just a gentle breeze of discouragement, and I'm flat on my back. No, there are people around the world who are suffering, and they are standing strong. So when we suffer, we need to be like them, to stand strong in our faith, no matter the circumstances. Be hopeful. Peter would have, or Peter would have said, be hopeful. Peter closes on a positive note and reminds us that God knows what he is doing and he is in complete control. Here's what he said, 1 Peter 5.10. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. Be hopeful. In these difficult days, be hopeful. We have God's grace. Notice that. In his kindness. He, it, with all of his grace, God called us. What an incredible statement. I don't understand it, but I marvel at it, that God called me into his family, that God called me into his service. What an honor that is, to know that in his kindness, with his grace, he has called us. Number three, we not only have God's grace, but we have God's promise he says here, he called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. Think about that. All the great things the Bible talks about. All the great things that God has promised to the greatest of all Christians. He is going to share with us because of what Christ did. Because of the salvation that he provided. What an incredible promise that when we're going through these hard times, we have the presence of God's grace. We have the, the promise that of his word. And number four, we have God's presence. Look at the list. He will restore, support, and strengthen us. He will be with us every part of the day. We have been working on the trailer. You've heard that a thousand times. We'll still be working on it 15 years, well, 15 years from now. I'm not sure we'll be doing anything, but you get the idea. But every once in a while, I'll say to Beth, just pick up that, pick up that end. And she'll say, you expect me to lift that because it's, it's a heavy load. I mean, we know that there are times when we can't do it by ourselves, so... What we'll say is, well, we'll wait till Sunday. And when all the guys are there, we'll have them help me and they'll lift it up and we'll move it to where it needs to go. There is a, a, an assurance that we have that no matter what we are going through, even if it is too much for us to lift and carry, there is one who is with us. 
He is forever faithful. He is full of grace, mercy, and love. He keeps every promise that he has made. And he says, oh, if you're going through a hard time, I'll help you restore that situation. I'll support you going through that difficulty. I will strengthen you as you go through that. What incredible promises we have. So Peter says at the end of his, end of his letter, listen, be humble, be watchful, be hopeful. And the final word, it's a familiar passage. I share it with you because here again, Paul sitting on around the table in this Bible study might have said the final word and we would have said amen at the end of this. And all of us knowing what Paul has gone through, we hear him testify. We are pressed on every side by troubles. The people in Peter's audience knew this experience, being perplexed and, and pressed on every side. But he goes on, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Christ so that the life of Christ may also be seen in our bodies. Something happens to us when we go through trials. When the Christian obediently follows the leading of God's Holy Spirit into these difficult situations, something happens. In that experience of the hard times, we become more like Christ. That's why when you're going through the absolute worst experiences of your life, people are watching all the more. They want to see what God will do for you when everything falls apart in your world. That's where we have our strongest message, our highest platform, is when we're going through the worst of times. He goes on, he says, Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. Press, perplexed, hunted, but it doesn't matter. We are not alone. If we submit to the mighty hand of God, his presence will be with us in every conceivable circumstance. What a great word of encouragement to the people of this day. And what a great word of encouragement to all of us. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful. Not that we are lucky in faith, not that we are deserving of special treatment. Lord, we know none of that is true. We are blessed because we have the promises found in your word. The promises that when we surrender and obediently follow and seek to do what honors you, that you are pleased by that. You empower us. You fill us with your Holy Spirit. You lead us in the difficult days. Father, the, the blessing of that is more than we can fully describe on this side of glory. Lord, we know that there's going to be a day when we'll be on the other side and we'll be able to look back and we'll be able to see your faithfulness in our lives. And Father, I know that all of us will marvel. All of us will give you great praise and glory. Lord, give us the, the insight today. Not wait till then, but Lord, give us that understanding, that insight today. Father, I ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.